Yeah, really valuable experience uh, that we had this past week to go play another game and and manage kind of a pseudo road game, pseudo bowl game, and unique circumstances, not only leading up to the game, but managing uh, a lot of unique twists and turns in the game. So I think it was essential and necessary for our growth and development, really valuable and getting ready now to go into ACC play and anxious to practice. So yeah, I'll take questions. As a defensive coordinator, what was it like preparing for Lamar Jackson? And now that he's gone, how much of what they're trying to do offensively has changed, if at all? Wow. Um, difficult to describe for Lamar Jackson because normal defense really isn't something that uh, was effective. You always had to, to have at least one number accounting for him, uh, pr preferably two, which then means you, you can't play normal defense which uh, they have very good receivers, they have good running backs, they have good skill and a good scheme. And so it simply became a numbers game when Lamar was there. Their approach is similar now. Um, they're playing two quarterbacks or have played two quarterbacks. So there's elements of the scheme that are sa the same. Neither is um, performing yet to the level that Lamar did, obviously, um, but still a challenge. Notice Derek's on the depth chart this week. What he's what has he kind of done to get there? And he doesn't have a number yet, too. I notice. Yeah, the um, two things uh, he's done a really nice job against our defense, uh, but just simply also depth at the offensive line. Both those things have contributed to um, considering him. So will he be able to play? Like, what's the, kind of the number situation? It's obviously yeah, he's got to earn one, and otherwise the depth is just pretend. Yeah, because uh, you can't play without a number. And RJ, is he? I mean, he plays. He played a little bit. How's he doing health-wise? Mm, I would say progressing, but still, sig I would say significantly away from uh, being 100 percent from what I've seen. Uh, you mentioned the two quarterbacks, so the retro refreshing, refreshment Cunningham. Can you talk about just how his athleticism is similar to Lamar Jackson's? Is well, it, as I you think, see it on film. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, anytime you compare someone to Lamar Jackson. Uh, I don't know really how you do that, um, but he's a dynamic athlete for sure. Um, doesn't yes doesn't yet possess the ability to throw the ball um, or the complete set of skills that Lamar has. But if you're talking just about athleticism, that's the closest um, where he might compare. In the past, you guys used Devontae Cross to kind of mirror Lamar's athleticism a little bit. Have you guys chosen that guy on the practice squad yet to, to do that this uh, week? Brennan Armstrong has been doing a really nice job. And while that's that's not an exact comparison, um, uh, I think he does really, really well, even though he's preparing to play on our offense and in our offense also. Uh, most likely, it will be him. Oh, no. um, Joey was in here earlier and talked about how when Ohio scored those three quick touchdowns, um, you know, it was kind of a shock to them. And, um, you know, you've seen this team react to that before. Um, he was talking about the stop that Bryce made on that fourth down play. H how did the defense respond this time compared to previous times? And, and how much of, a, of an advance in the program is that? I think it was a demonstration of resiliency and some really unique circumstances. Uh, leading back, if I can remember, uh, we attempted a pass, got sacked, um, the ball came out. So there was one sudden change opportunity right there. Um, and what was frustrating is the receiver that caught the ball on that play was actually double covered. Um, and so we, we blew a coverage, so that was frustrating. Then they blast the kickoff right off front of our front line guys. Um, and so get the ball back again and, and have a, uh, a player get speed in man coverage. And then the first drive of the second half, um, they, there's a score. And so I think what was happening is, is not only were there execution, all in different areas, um, but there were execution mistakes that were that was leading more to anger and frustration than um, hope or despair. You know, it was just they knew they were more capable, frustrated because uh, they knew the game was clearly out of hand and then miscues had allowed it to, to be contested again, and then their response from that point on, including after the punt return or after the faked or the the muff punt that we had, then the stand there. So I think they um, from the first score in the second half, there became 
uh, a kind of a line in the sand of enough already, and then a regrouping that happened. I think it was Joey who mentioned Zane Zandir and his performance the other day, nine tackles, I believe. Just talk about what you've seen in him. When Zane came in as a first year, uh, he was tabbed by us. He, he came in um, not as an inside linebacker, um, was a, a receiver and a safety and an athlete. And we originally thought he was going to be an outside linebacker, but his leadership skills immediately with our first years in that group, it took less than a week. We thought, um, I thought that it was kind of Micah's heir apparent. Um, and so we moved him early on with basically that sentiment. I said that to him in my office is that, that um, we'd like him to be Micah's understudy for a year. And, and that, that's a unique position to be in. So he's learning a lot from Micah, but knowing he'd probably never see the field. And so there was a, that was a unique transition for Zane, who then had a really good spring, a fantastic summer. And then each of the opportunities he's had to play um, in the first two games prior to this one, his grades were exceptional between like 12 and 18 plays, you know, so it was limited duty. And then when, with Malcolm getting hurt, um, Zane kind of got his debut at UVA uh, and really played well and really played hard and was very effective. So what was Malcolm and the team's loss going in ended up gaining us another uh, qualified linebacker, which now our depth and our experience has increased. So uh, Zane also did a nice job on kickoff cover. So not only was he starting defensively, he, he's learning what that's like and also playing on the teams, and, and he did well. When you think about big picture and the goals you've talked about for this year, uh, ACC home games, how important is it to you know, win those, protect your house, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, every home game, whether it's ACC or not, is, is critical. I mean, every time that you can get an advantage in this league, at any level, no matter how minuscule or how significant, you have to leverage it because they don't come very often. Um, everyone has good coaches, everyone has good players, um, and it, it's a challenge every single week. And so if you have a chance to be at home or any advantage you can possibly get uh, to squander it, um, uh, it's very difficult to get it back if you do. Um, so. We think home games for us are an advantage. Um, we're looking forward to being home and playing. And um, I, I like the resiliency of our team. We've demonstrated that we're capable but inconsistent is what I think we've shown so far. And uh, that's been my message to the team in driving home the areas we have to improve, knowing the clock is ticking. And having Louisville come in as a, a nice uh, additional incentive just to say, you know, uh, let's go with that question about consistency. When you think about your offense, do you have a sense of what is the real deal that the offense that was so explosive last week, the one that struggled against Indiana, was Indiana a better opponent? Do you have a sense yet of, of really where that unit's at? I'd like to say I have a better sense, um, but I don't have a complete sense. Uh, you saw a similar performance by our offense from Richmond and Ohio. I would say those two performances were similar. Indiana was clearly better defensively than either of the other two opponents. Um, and then you have the weather. So some level in there was our offensive performance, but I don't think that was the perfect reflection. Uh, neither do I think was Richmond and Ohio the perfect reflection in terms of caliber of opponent or caliber of defense. So somewhere in there. So I have a better idea, but I wish I could say I had a perfect idea, but we are um, becoming clearer of, of where the ball needs to go and to whom how frequently the balance necessary, where potential weak spots are, what's been uncovered that way, at least through the competition we played. And we think we can project that pretty well now into ACC play, at least in formulating game plans. Bronco, I think through two games, people obviously saw what Bryce could do running, but there was question about his passing ability. Obviously, Olamide inflated his stats hugely, yeah. on, but 25 out of 30, um, kind of shows a different Bryce than people had seen the first two games. How much does that expanded Bryce um, make it diff more difficult for defenses? And how much does the um, explosiveness of Bryce and Alamade and Jordan kind of put the onus on some of these other guys to actually kind of fill in some of those big play? Yeah, what, what, what's what been clear, if you look at just at the Indiana game, and I'll try to address this maybe in a roundabout way, Alamade 
did not have much production versus uh, Indiana and are reflected on the scoreboard. Any one of those pieces that does not play well um, will reflect on the score. This past week, um, Hasis, and he's done a, a, a nice job, I would say, through three games, but I was really impressed with how he played. So we got solid perform a solid performance from Bryce and Jordan and Alameda and Hasis. Now, when that all happens, uh, that's our best chance week in and week out. And so what I'm pressing our offensive staff and our players for is, is yeah, that core group, that has to be every week. And then we're trying to add additional members to that, possibly Tavares Kelly, possibly Terrell Jana, possibly Devontae Cross, possibly P.K. Keir. Um, those, and the more the better. When a team chooses to play off coverage, when they choose to play, play uh, mainly zone, those possession throws allow us to keep moving the chains and those yards after the catch. Um, when it chooses to play man or man free, then um, there's a chance for uh, the quarterback run game um, and, and other areas to be exploited if that core group of players I said are all performing well and we need them to because that really is the stress and the balance that we need to, um, for the defenses to struggle. Coach, you've been honest in the number of times coming in here about the lack of depth on the, de the defensive line, but it seemed like there were a lot of times of pressure on Rourke in that previous game. How did you and Coach Soto feel about they graded out and preparing for a bigger line this week? In yeah, the, the grading is, is still not um, to the level we want, but the development is becoming more effective. Our run fits, the, the run game uh, really was a non-factor for Ohio, excluding uh, the quarterback scramble. Um, which uh, I'm still mad about. Uh, but the normal run game had zero bearing with almost the same plays that we defended from Indiana in a very similar system. So I think our fits and our consistency and our pad level and our mindset improved there. Um, and the defensive line had a lot to do with that in terms of consistency. Jordan Redmond improved his game. Richard Burney continues to improve. Eli is is just kind of the same no matter where you put him, um, what planet, what condition, he just he just plays. There's, it's just the same. Uh, Mandy is becoming healthier and Aaron Famui. And so really those five are developing and growing and it can't be fast enough. And But there was a significant change from week two to week three by that group. Um, as they not only fit the run, but with four-man pressure, were able to affect the quarterback at a higher level than they did the week before. Bronco, kind of, kind of following up on that, but the defense as a whole, what kind of improvement have you seen from one, two, to three? And I, I've seen about the same performance, actually. Um, there's relative inconsistencies that show up. Um, Richmond, I think we got off to a very strong start, uh, but showed um, as we're becoming even more aggressive in man coverage and press man and, and really forcing opponents to, uh, to be one-dimensional. Um, that was the beginning, and there were a few balls caught on us there that surprised me. And Indiana, um, some balls downfield, 50-50 balls, and a few inconsistencies in the run um, was still a, a strong output, uh, output by points. So kind of a mixed bag, but still pretty pleased this past game. Um, Run game, I really liked, uh, but then now sudden change and reacting to that and keeping points off the board. There were 14 points by sudden change. I guess you could call it 17, really. Um, and yeah, I expect field goals. And so all, all our expectations just keep going up for that group. And so that gave us a great challenge and test of multiple emotional swings and sudden changes uh, that we now have to respond and get better at, which hadn't been present the first two weeks. So there's a whole new le or a whole new situation that came up. Oh, we get we have to tighten that up a little bit, which I was glad that happened because it exposed some things we need to do better. Coach, a couple of weeks ago after the Richmond game, you mentioned you were going to take a harder look at the place kicking situation. Yeah. Uh, you thought you might be in a situation where AJ was your closer guy, Hunter was your further away guy. After this past week, uh, any thoughts on mm -hmm. changes in, that might be coming? Yeah, th that competition's open um, and Hunter will have every chance to earn the job. Um, that has been in place, that exact um, scenario. Um, however, it, it's, it's basically uh, um, ground zero and start again now that I've seen three games and I'm willing to take into account this week's performance and that will probably drive um, who's our field goal kicker 
um, regardless of range going into this week. Bronco, you played 17 true freshmen last year. You're at eight so far. I realize that number may well grow, but does that speak to improved depth along across the board, or are there players you hoped or expected to contribute right away who are not able to? Um, yeah, I was expecting more, and actually the quality of play by some of our existing players um, has been a really nice surprise. Our there's two parts, remember, to our program. There's the right the recruiting and the, the onboarding, but there's also the development within. And with Coach Grizz, some of our players have made jumps beyond what I expected them to and separated themselves from where I thought maybe a first year would come in and challenge, and they're just not letting it happen. And so there's still a number, as we mentioned, Derek Devine, there's still a number of possibilities. Uh, but originally, I thought it would be close to the 17 number. Uh, doesn't look like that's going to happen at this point. Um, might be closer to 12-ish. Maybe hard to say, but that's if I'm projecting. Coach, uh, talking about Snowden, uh, how has he really developed as a pass rusher? That that is his natural strength. A year ago, we we uh, predominantly used him in nickel, um, as he was still kind of underdeveloped from size. But I'm I'm talking maybe mass and physical strength, but certainly capable. Um, by agility and presence and length. And so he was one dimensional in terms of pass rush. So he still has maintained that part. Um, but the pressure he got on the first play of the game defensively, he wasn't going around, he was going through, which uh, surprised the opponent and was very effective. So he's, he's able now with an increased, uh, increased physical capacity to now add a physical element to his pass rush game, which uh, is a whole different set for the offensive line. Normally when they set against him, they can set a little softer and anticipate edge rush and pushing him by the quarterback. Now when they set soft, he's able to uh, push the pocket more, and that led to our first turnover. And when you were recruiting him, did that length jump off the, off the film, and did you always see him as an outside linebacker? I didn't know what he was other than he's a really good basketball player um, and watched him play hoops and run the floor and kind of as a power forward looking player and dunking and jumping. And then um, most of his film was at wide receiver in high school and he wasn't highly recruited. Um, but in three, four, we like size, we like length and we like athleticism. And so uh, one of our projections has worked out really well and he's been a great fit. Chris Sharp had the touchdown catch against Indiana. He had a nice block on, on Jordan's third touchdown. What, where would you assess him in his development? And you know, what does he mean? And what could he mean to the offense? What, what's happening with Chris is um, he is, uh, so we, we think you, know, you have to earn trust. And then you have to verify trust once you're given a role. And Chris's grades in week one and two were exceptional in how he was blocking. His blocking then allowed us to say, wait, what, what else can he do where they might think he's blocking, but he's not. And then we were able to slip him by a defender who thought he was blocking and throw the ball to him. And, and so that role wasn't expected, but was earned. He'd be similar to maybe the question we were talking about of maybe first years playing. Chris has been one of those guys that he kind of has developed past where we thought he might be able to produce. And that's been helpful to us, and we need it con to continue, and we also need it to continue on special teams. Coach, on this side, the, uh, by my count, you get it was two touchdowns or 25 yards or more that you allowed on Saturday. I think that's 34 in the first 28 games here. You had 34 in your last five years at BYU. Is the scheme more aggressive here, or is it just more of the inconsistencies and experience yeah. part of it? It, it, it is the biggest difference. Um, the inconsistencies either through maturity, position mastery, and simply um, resiliency and experience. And so building a threshold and an expectation of how to play and at what level, regardless of circumstance, for the length of time necessary, we haven't yet been able to sustain that to where regardless of where they are, what situation or who we're playing, Big plays don't happen. And huge emphasis this year that Coach Howell and Coach Papinga and the guys are making. And we know the exact metric of, of how many big plays usually equal wins versus loss and what that number is. Um, 
and they're working on it. We're working on it every single day. To this point, that code has not been cracked. Um, after five years of what 34, and then um, it's just uh, it's one of our biggest challenges, and we're still working on it. You mentioned Snowden being a high school receiver. Uh, Zane was, I think, a high school. Re it was. That's an unusual pairing, isn't it? Receiver to college linebacker, and what's worked in his case for Zane. For Zane, it wasn't only the the receiver standpoint. I watched I watched him play basketball as well, and he played basketball like a linebacker. Um, I've told him that, so it's not you know he's not going to be mad at me. But um, clearly, in watching him play basketball, he wasn't a receiver, and I didn't think he was a defensive back. Um, he might have fouled out in the game, which I saw as a good thing um, from a mindset perspective uh, as a defensive coach. Um, but I, I thought he'd be a safety, a safety, a Sam or a Mike, and but that was after I saw him play basketball. And so, I even forgot what the question was. But yeah, I like him as a linebacker now. And uh, one of Louisville's guys, Makai Becton, was one of the mm -hmm. kind of early in-state guys that you were involved in. I think we're in the Final Five for for his selection. Uh, what do you remember about his recruitment, and what have you seen from kind of how he's developed? Yeah, we put more time and energy into Makai Becton than probably any recruit we had up to that point, I, I was certain he was coming to Virginia. Um, just shows I'm not always right, which you guys know. Um, so yeah, I was surprised and, and um, it was just one more reality check as to what it will take to get the very best players in our own state to come uh, to play at Virginia, at least under current circumstances. That perception and that is becoming better and becoming easier, but still a challenge. Um, and I think he's a very good player. And our evaluation was certainly correct, and he would have helped our, our team a great deal. Bryce said earlier today that he wasn't familiar with hurricanes and that he'd never seen much rain either. Uh, what is your, what, after three years, what is your take on the weather here? <laughs> yeah. that. There is a, a conversation we just had. Um, so my son Cutter is on his mission in Uruguay, and uh, Holly uh, creates a newsletter. Uh, she calls it the IV Connection um, each week that she shares with him that kind of updates him on family and different things happening. And, and um, there seems to be a weather update every week. Um, so it's a topic in our house more than I've ever it's, our marriage, we've talked about weather more in the past three years than we have in our entire marriage and in my entire life, probably. <laughs> and the first three games of a rain delay and then the Indiana game and then having to change locations, it just doesn't stop. So what I would say about the weather is, yeah, it just doesn't stop. Um, so a similar experience, not identical but related, when I chose Oregon State University um, out of junior college, I remember being uh, choosing to live in the dorms, which was a mistake my first semester. But my my window overlooked a roof of a, um, a another dorm, and anyway, sometimes uh, kids were throwing garbage out of their windows and stuff. And anyway, it rained for 31 days straight, um, <laughs> 31 straight days, and and um, I remember thinking this this can't happen. And uh, I'd look out my window every day and see the stuff they'd throw out the window just drenched and it was gray and yeah I realized then man you just got to be who you're going to be and do what you're going to do because it is going to rain <laughs> and I'm it's not the same here but there's going to be some kind of weather issues and you just got to do what you're going to do how you're going to do it regardless and yeah so I'm kind of reliving some of my college days but in a different way. Uh, you told us a couple of weeks ago that Bryce's biggest gains has been in the passing game. 25 for 30 is almost hard to do against air. Yeah. What did he do specifically to have that great a percentage against Ohio? And specifically, what has he done to improve as a passer? Well, it's been the target. Um, he already was a natural runner and a natural athlete. Uh, but Coach Beck and, and Robert, Coach and I, man, they've, they've worked really hard to find what throws he currently is comfortable with and to whom and in what situations and then against what looks. And so those, those, those designs, the, the, the pass play plan for that game matched perfectly his current ability level versus the looks they gave us. And so he was comfortable, he was rhythmical, 
and he was um, he was successful based on his preparation within the design he was given. He was given a good design. His emphasis based on knowing he needed to improve that part, he's been relentless in developing that. Um, as my role kind of keeps expanding as a head coach and and as I work to accelerate our program, um, I have a chance to meet with our offense early each week to basically describe what the defenses are doing and why. And that's accelerated the looks, the planning, and the implementation of what might work as well. So um, our planning, I think, is becoming more effective as a program, specific to UVA, but also specific to Bryce. Bronco Bryce said that um, Alameda was really ticked off after the Indiana game that he didn't have more of an impact. Makes two of us. <laughs> well, he said that for the two days after that when they got back, they spent an awful lot of time working together with a football that was soaked in water and stuff like that. Kind of how gratifying is that when your best players are doing things like that on their own? And how much can you hold that up to the other guys on the team to say, okay, he's the best player on the team and this is what he's doing? The, the best teams that I've coached and the best programs that I've been with are the best play, are, are reflected by the best players being the hardest workers and carrying the most. Uh, caring meaning it shows in the extra things they do. Um, I've used the example before um, when I was coaching at New Mexico and Erlacher was there. We won three games our first year, then four, then five. Anyway, he, he never had a winning season with us. Um, but what he did is teach the, the younger players. And so his legacy was actually stronger when he left. And then we won five, six, seven, eight over time because of his example. And he kind of taught our program how to. And that's what's happening with Chris Peace. It's what's happening with what happened with Quinn, with Micah, um, Smoke. Um, some of the players that have been here, Andre Lavroni was a great example of who he became. And so it's becoming more of what UVA football is and the habits that it takes, um, which is one of the beginning signs of um, what sustainability can look like. Coach, you talked about Chuck Davis as a punt returner. You said he catches everything. You, yeah. you love that about preserving possessions. Tavares is explosive. Um, is that competition open as yes. like with the kickers and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, and there, there's a clear trade, as we all saw. Um, and I will err on the side of catching the ball going forward. As Tavares is being developed, we already saw, even with safe punt, the defense out there when he did get the one opportunity to return it. Yeah, he, he's dynamic. Uh, part of being dynamic is also being immature and unseasoned. Um, and, and that re was reflected on the the last opportunity he had to return the ball. And so, yeah, I've got to do a really nice job of deciding when and where um, Chuck is baseline. So we start there. And then when and where and if then Tavares is able to contribute in that role. Good. You mentioned Snowden's basketball career. Are there examples from your past of, of other guys other guys have been basketball guys have gone to be great linebackers? It started with uh, a Bronson Kafusi, our defensive line coach at BYU. Uh, Steve Kafusi, his son Bronson, who was a second round pick for the, the Ravens. Um, we really liked him as an athlete and basketball player. He then played both at BYU. And then his younger brother Corbin was clearly a better basketball player than football player, but I thought he would end up playing great football. He then played both at BYU. And so they started as long, tall outside backers, then both became linemen. Um, but I, I like the athleticism of the power forward type basketball player who might be a tight end, might be a defensive end, might be an offensive tackle, uh, might be an outside backer. Have you ever had an outside backer with Snowden's wingspan? Man, not that I remember, no. Thank <laughs> you.